All right, Matthew chapter 3. We're going to read the whole chapter. I'll read the odd-numbered verses on my own. You join me in the even-numbered verses. And also the last verse, please. Matthew chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he, uh, for this is, uh, he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and will he would thoroughly purge his floor and gather wheat into his garner, but he will burn the chaff <clears throat> with unquenchable fire. <clears throat> <Excuse me. clears throat> then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending, of, upon, lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And now let's pray. Father. Uh, please empower preacher, use them to bring the word of God to us. Help us to be uh, attentive hearers, good hearers, uh, hearers that intend to uh, uh, work at uh, obeying you and uh, what you have for us now. Help us. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Treasure thou art. 
I, King of Heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven, joys, O bright heaven, sun, heart of my own heart, what have I behold? Still be my vision, O ruler of all. Alistair. All right, you got your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 this morning. We're going to be using this chapter, and I'm going to be pointing out several verses that go along with each point. I only have three points in my message this morning. You know, most of the time, you're probably used to me coming and say, oh, I got six or seven or nine or 50. No, I don't have never had that many. You know, but I remember uh, going to college, and Dr. Ray Young got up and said, I've got 27 points to give you today. And we're like, what? And he, no one actually believed him, and he'd show us, and he gave us all 27 points. You know, but I wasn't as uh, lengthy as most uh, messages are. He did it in about 50 minutes or so. We're not going to do that this morning. Give me about 30, 35 minutes this morning, and, and we'll be on our way. But I believe that this topic is, uh, topic is extremely, extremely important. You know, going to camp this week, you know, one of the things that, you know, we learned or our kids learned in spiritual warfare is you can be your own hindrance. You can be your own hindrance when it comes down to uh, allowing God to work in your life. You know, so the title of the message this morning is Preparing the Way for Christ. Preparing the Way for Christ. You know, John the Baptist is is one of the greatest uh, illustrations we could use, biblically speaking, when it comes to someone who prepared the way for Christ. God used him in in a phenomenal way to preach to the very uh, individuals that, you know, some of them were probably going to be the ones that persecuted Christ. You know, he, he was a bold man, empowered by, by God, to preach messages that, you know, were moving and motivating to the point of where God spoke to the individual's hearts to get right with God, and many of them did. You know, so my question to you this morning is, is the way for Christ prepared in your life? Are you allowing your life to be open to Christ? Or, or even going that far to say, are you preparing the way for Christ for others? You know, are you preparing the way for Christ for others? You know, so we're going to get right into this this morning. I'm not going to belabor anything this morning when it comes down to the message. I want to just get right into this. Just as, as an opening, you know, I read this by Charles Spurgeon recently. He said, he, he who does not prepare for death is more than an ordinary fool. He is a madman. He is a madman. You know, when it comes down to maybe the fact that in your life, you may be sitting here and you may not be saved this morning. You know, please consider salvation. Please consider the sacrifice that Christ made for you. Please consider the fact that God loves you, and that love should translate into you being willing to accept that love. You know, so this morning, I want you to open your heart to the Word of God. Allow your heart to be prepared for what you're going to receive. And at the same time, allow your heart to to receive it so it can be given to someone else. So we're going to get right into this this morning. What can we learn from John the Baptist on preparation for Christ. And we're going to take this whole passage and we're going to break it down into these three points, give you some sub points to go along with it to help you. Maybe you're in here this morning and you're not saved. We, hey, you've come to a place that you've got people that care about you. You've got a, a pastor that pastors this, tr- this church that loves you enough to tell you the truth, to not water down the gospel, to give it to you straight just exactly how it is, and, and to give you the best opportunity to, to take that opportunity to get saved, to make that decision to get saved this morning. You know, if you were to take a look at John the Baptist's life, you could sum it up in this phrase. He got in the way, and then he got out of the way. And you say, what in the world does that mean? He got in the way. Jesus Christ in the Bible says that he he, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He knew who the way was. He pointed all those followers him to Christ. He got in the way, and then he got out of the way for Christ to work. And that's what we need to do in our life. Get in Christ, and then get out of the way and allow him to work through our lives. So let me give you this this morning. Number one, take your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. And as you're turning there, 
you know, keep your place in Matthew chapter 3 because I'm going to point out a few verses here that I want you to see that go along with this, breaking this passage down and giving an application from John the Baptist's life on preparation for Christ. But Jeremiah chapter 4, we're going to look at the first four verses this morning. Again, you'll have to bear with me if I've got to pause a few times. You know, I, I go to camp. When I go to camp, I don't, I'm not there just to, to uh, be a spectator. I'm there to be a participant. And I love being able to participate in camp. We went to an indoor soccer complex uh, that we went to last year. And huge, huge building with AstroTurf in it and a lot of fun. But they did campers versus counselors. You know, we had some counselors there that, you know, were much older than I am. Uh, one of them took a soccer ball to the face. He's in his late 60s. Took a soccer ball to the face. Thankfully, nothing broken. You know, I took a soccer ball to the rib cage, and I think I might have bruised a rib, so I'm pressing, pressing it out. So just pray for me that, you know, that that would be taken care of. I'm beginning to realize I'm not getting any younger. You know, I'd say, well, you're 30. You know, you're in your, you know, I know. So I was <laughs> like, are you kidding me? You know, I might be able to ba bounce back a little bit better than most, but I'm understanding that, hey, I'm out of shape. I may be turning into a shape, but I'm not in the shape that I should be. You know, so please, please. Yeah, I know, yeah. Juniors aren't as rough as teenagers are. <laughs> yeah. So that, that would be a good, probably a good idea. No, it's, I love teen camp. We had a lot of fun this week, um, but uh, just it's the way it goes sometimes. But all right, listen, now I'm giving you time to get to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. I'm going to reference back to Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 3. So if you've got your bookmarker there, you can turn back there, and then we'll look at Jeremiah chapter 4. Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 3, the Bible says this, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Number one, what can we learn from John the Baptist on preparation for Christ? Clear the way. Clear the way. You know, John the Baptist cleared the way for Christ. He was the forerunner. He was the one that was pushing everything towards Christ's coming and, and uh, being able to, to, if you will, till the ground for those that were going to be followers of Christ, those that were going to follow him on, on his uh, um, three-and-a-half-year ministry that he was there. And, and uh, we get this, letter A, for us. You say, well, how am I supposed to clear the way in my life? Letter A, clear the way for your own heart for Jesus. Clear the way in your own heart. For Jesus. Look at Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, if, if thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not, uh, then shalt thou not remove. Uh, and sh thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth and judgment and in righteousness, and the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quench it, because of the evil of your doings. You know, you read this, and I know that you know, I, we live in a day and age where I've heard preachers say, oh, well, the Old Testament doesn't apply to us today. That is straight out of the pits of hell. You know, that is, the Old Testament applies just as much to us today as it did during the Bible times. Principles that are there. You know, of course, in the book of Jeremiah, God is using uh, Jeremiah the prophet to speak to his people, and he's telling them, hey, you need to uh, till up those grounds, that fallow ground that is there. And he'd say, well, he was telling them to go plow their fields. No, he was telling them to till up those fall, that fallow ground in their heart. It was a heart issue. They had hard hearts. You know, here in Maine, we've got a lot of clay, and clay is not always easy to get through. It's, it's hard to dig in. You know, and I think about Americans. As Americans, you know, we grow up in a country where everything is available to us, and so many go to God with hard hearts, not willing to allow God to penetrate it, to push against them. You know, I think of Pharaoh in the Bible in the days of Moses, and he was a hard-hearted individual, hard-hearted. You know, he, he was willing to deny the very miracles that he was seeing God do to the point where he didn't want to give in to God. You know, in our churches, in churches of like faith today like this, we even have some Christians that sit in services like these that sit there with a hard heart, not willing for God to penetrate. Oh, he, hey, uh, God's not speaking to me, but I know who he is speaking to. And we think in our minds of another individual that may be sitting in the service. Well, they need this sermon, when ultimately we're the ones that need it. You know, God's coming to us as Christians and say, hey, I want you to clear the way for me. I want you to open up your heart. Allow me to soften it. Allow that ground to be tilled up so I can work in your heart in a way where I can use you. 
It may be you're in here this morning and you're not saved. You know, it may be that someone's talked to you previously about salvation and your heart was hard towards God speaking. Your heart was hard towards God's leadings. Hey, now it's time to till the ground. Allow God to come in. Allow God. Give in to him. Don't, don't fight him. You know, I, I camped this week. There were several individuals, about a half dozen individuals that received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior for the very first time. Very first time. And I remember, uh, I think it was the middle of the week, Pastor Baker, who, uh, who uh, is the pastor at Naughty, K-N-O-T-T-Y, Naughty Oak, not N-A-G-U-H-T. I thought, I'm like, what in the world? You know, I, I, I hear him correctly, not, Naughty Oak Baptist Church down in, I believe it's Connecticut, if I remember correctly, preached a message. And they had an altar call, and, and about half a dozen people stepped out of the aisle. And, and uh, as a counselor, I went down to help out. And, and uh, one of the individuals I talked to was already a saved individual, but was having a hard time dealing with doubt in his life because of a hard heart, not wanting to deal with it, saying, you know what, I put it off and put it off and put it off. And, and I, 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 got, I believe God prepares people. In, to, to be put in your way that you can help maybe that you went through the very same thing and I sat down with this 13 year old boy and I was explaining to him I said you know what you remind me of myself I go I, I believe there's a reason why out of all these kids that I could have spoken to that was the one that walked up to me and said hey I need to talk to you about something not even it's not from our church but another church down in Connecticut and I said okay what's going on and I sat down with him he said you know I've been hard-hearted you know, towards, towards God and with dealing with this issue in my life. And he goes, I need, I need to get some assurance. So I was able to get, go through it with him biblically and give him some understanding and assurance and, and help to till up that ground for God to be able to work in his life. You know, he understood, hey, I'm not able to move forward until I deal with this issue. And that's exactly what God was telling the Israelite people. If you don't deal with the issue, you're going to force me to deal with it. There's going to be a consequence. You know, and hey, if you look at the Israelite nation, sometimes they listened and sometimes they didn't. And God had to take them through a consequence to get them to turn back to him. And many a times they go back and forth between this. Don't be that type of a Christian. You know, if you're in here this morning and you're not saved, be that individual that says, you know what, I'm willing to see the gospel. I'm willing to consider the offer God has for me. You know, and, and accepting that, that Jesus Christ of the Bible, his sacrifice for me. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Don't turn there in your Bibles for the sake of time. Uh, I, I got several verses we'll go over. But Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, the Bible says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Hey, now is the time to seek the Lord. Now is the time to break up the fallow ground. You know, we're creatures of habit. We like to put things off especially teenagers. You, you parents in your have, that t have teenagers or, you know, children, you know, in general, you know, like to do this. You come to them and say, hey, I want you to go do this. Yeah, yeah, I'll get to it in a minute. You know, I was that teenager. My dad often would come to me and say, hey, this is what I want you to do. And, oh, yeah, dad, I'll get to it in a minute. And he'd never get to it. No, my dad wasn't coming to me and saying, hey, when you can get to it. And I said, hey, I want you to do it now. You know, we need to be the type of individual in our life as Christians that we allow God when he speaks to us, say, okay, Lord, yes, Lord, I'm doing it now. I'm not going to put it off. I'm not going to wait till tomorrow. I'm not going to put it off for next week or next month or next year. There may not be a tomorrow. There may not be a next week and next month, next year. The Bible says that our life is but a vapor. It's here one minute and it vanisheth away the next. You know, it may be that God's speaking to you today and you're not saved. God said, hey, now is the time. Now is the time to break up that foul ground. Allow me to, to have that opportunity to, uh, to, to save you. You know, it may be that you're here this morning and, and uh, uh, God is, is speaking to you when it comes to breaking up that foul ground in your life to, for him to work in maybe other ways. Maybe, not letter B, uh, of, of uh, clear the way, letter B for others. Clear the way for others, their hearts for Jesus. Revelation chapter 20, turn there in your Bibles this morning. Revelation, very last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 20. You know, God doesn't just want to work in your heart. God wants to work in everyone's heart. And you may be the tool that can be used, the plow, if you will, to help break up someone else's fallow ground. It may be that God uses you as the, the uh, 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 microphone, if you will, in someone's life to help them to realize that there's something there that they need to get right with God so that they can have a relationship with God that's proper, so that they can be used to reach others for the cause of Christ. Revelation chapter 20, look at verses 11 through 15. The Bible says this, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. 
And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And, the death, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. You know, you may be the tool that God uses to help someone to avoid this second death. Each and every one of us deserves to go to an eternity in hell. Do you remember the day someone talked to you about your salvation? Someone who was willing to prepare your heart for Jesus Christ? That's exactly what John the Baptist was doing. He was crying a voice in the wilderness preparing the hearts of those that needed to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. It may be that God uses you to do the same in someone else's life. And I'm not talking about you being a pastor. I'm not talking about you being an evangelist or a missionary. But God gives the command to everyone, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Meaning, hey, proclaim it. The word preach means to proclaim. God wants every one of us to be a proclaimer. You know, think about this. For you that are saved in here, what if someone didn't come to you and give you the gospel? You know, I had the privilege. I'm, I'm a third generation Christian on my mom's side. And I don't even know. We, we go back at least five or six generations uh, at the very bare minimum on my dad's side. I had the opportunity to gr grow up in a Christian home. I am not a second generation Christian. I'm not even a third generation Christian. You know, many, many generations on one side of the family. You know, and I think about, though, what if, you know, I, I, I look at I'm, I'm blessed. God put me in a family that they take this thing of salvation seriously. But I've often wondered, what if? My dad, even being a Christian, decided not to speak to his son about salvation. You know, I've even gone so far to, to say, what if God, you know, had, had, had put me in a third world country? Would a missionary have come to that country to speak to me? You know, for us that have received salvation, God has given us a gift and he doesn't want us to hoard it for ourselves. God wants us to go to others and give them that very same gospel so that they don't have to go through this second judgment so that they don't have to end up in a lake of fire for all of eternity. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. You know, you may be sitting in here today and think, oh, I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, I've never, you know, I've knocked on many doors. I've talked to many people. I've heard people, I've asked them, say, hey, you know, do you, uh, are you, you know, have you ever uh, thought about sin? Are you a sinner? I've had people say, well, I've never murdered anybody. I'm like, well, that's a good thing. Praise God for that, because I've, I've talked to people that have. You know, praise God that you haven't murdered anybody. Well, I don't think I've really done anything too bad. We try to justify our sins. And in God's eyes, our righteousness is as filthy rags. In God's eyes, we're all sinners. Because he tells us, as it is written, there is none righteous. Not one of us is right. You may be sitting here this morning and you say, well, you know, God would still accept me because I've never done anything too wrong. You know, I don't think I need to ask him for that salvation. No, you need him. Because if you've committed just one wrong, you know, you're guilty in God's sight. And we all have. It is say, really? Sure. I've met a one, I can count on one hand how many people I've talked to that actually believe they've never done anything wrong in their life. You know, I knocked on the door one time. This gentleman came out, and a very, very uh, respectable gentleman. He, he was very uh, open, you know, to the gospel, and I, I gave him the gospel, and, you know, I, I got into that very first portion, and I asked him, I go, have you ever done anything wrong before? He goes, no. What? I go, you mean you didn't tell me you've never told a lie? No. I was like, well, let me take this one step further. Uh, I go, you mean to tell me you obeyed your parents every single time they told you to do something? Yeah, I obeyed my parents. I, go, I almost wanted to say, I didn't go this far because I don't want to offend. I almost wanted to say, can I have your parents' number? Because I want to talk to them. You know, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, can we confirm this? Because I guarantee you if I talk to your parents, they're going to have the exact opposite, you know, uh, uh, testimony. I can't go any further with an individual that doesn't see, see that there is sin in their life, that they're lost. They got to get lost before they can get saved. You know, if you're in here this morning, you're unrighteous, just like all of us are. Every single one of us has, has not done right. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6, 23 tells us because of that, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Each and every one of us deserves, deserves to go to a place called hell. That should scare you enough to say, you know what? I have enough respect to God to get saved in my life. But it should help motivate you to say, you know what, I don't want anybody else to have to go through that either. You know, I don't want my family members. I don't want my coworkers. I don't even want my enemies. You know, I don't wish hell upon my enemies in understanding the way the Bible, uh, the Bible describes it. 
That should motivate you to prepare the hearts of individuals you talk to. Are they all going to get saved? Probably not. You know, but at the very least, you did your job to tell them, to warn them. Are you clearing the way of others' hearts for Jesus? Number two, turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. So number one, what can we learn from John the Baptist on pre preparation for Christ? Number one, he cleared the way. Are you clearing the way in your own heart? Are you breaking up your own fallow ground? Are you clearing the way in, in someone else's life, in their heart, to help them to be able to receive Christ? You know, sometimes that just takes us being uh, uh, an individual that shows someone that you care. You know, people want to know that you care before they want to know what you know. You know, especially in New England, folks. I, I've gone and, you know, I, I was in Colorado for five years, and the dynamic and the atmosphere in Colorado is so much different than New England. You know, you knock on a door out there, and almost everybody you talk to is willing to talk to you. I had two doors that I can remember in five years that I had slammed in my face. I was here for three months, and I, I've had at least one person cuss me out. You know, I got the cops called me within a six-month period. I mean, it's like, you know, it's a different dynamic. It happens that way. But to allow those things to get in the way of us sharing the gospel, you know, who are we? We could be that individual, looking at them, saying, you know what, maybe I need to care a little bit more about them. Maybe I need to get to know them a little bit more. You know, some of these individuals I talk with aren't going to get saved on the first time. It may be the same way in your life. It may be the same person you're talking to. Maybe they just need to get to know you a little bit. That's how New Englanders are. This is my bubble. Don't pop my bubble. You know, this is my bubble. Don't get in my bubble. You know, if they don't know you, you know, they may be a little bit more resilient to getting the gospel. So it may take you showing them that you care before they want to know what you know. Number two, declare the way. In uh, verses 7 through 12 of the passage we read this morning, it all goes over John the Baptist's ministry. He declared the way. He wasn't saying, hey, I'm the way to get to heaven. No, he was saying, hey, there is a one that is coming that I am not worthy to loose the latchet on his sandals. And I'm, not, I'm, well, I'm not worthy. He prepared the way uh, for the hearts. He cleared the way for the hearts. He declared the way. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. This is Jesus Christ speaking here. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may all be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know, uh, and, 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 sorry, and whether I go, ye know, and the way ye go, know, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had, no, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. You know, folks, I, I get so frustrated with this modern mentality of all roads lead to, lead to heaven. That, that's, that's straight from the devil himself. There's only one way. Jesus Christ himself declared it. He says, I'm the way. There is no other way. You can't get there through Buddha. You can't get there through Gandhi's teachings. And you, know, you can't get there through Muhammad's teachings. There is only one God, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the way. You know, John the Baptist, as he got up, he wasn't declaring his gospel. He was declaring God's gospel. He was declaring Jesus Christ as being king, being Jesus Christ being Lord of lords. He was the individual that was going to help those individuals have redemption in their life. He declared the way. Are you declaring the way? You know, I know I, if I were to go to our, our church members here that have, have been here for many, many, many years, I know that you believe. And I've talked to many of you. I know that you believe in your heart. But are you telling others? Are you telling others? Has it consumed you so much so that you're so thankful for what God did for you, you're willing to talk to someone else about it? And you're not ashamed of it. You know, I've used this so many times in, in opportunities going to First Baptist Church of Hammond. And I had 14,000 church members that attended services during that time of when I was there. And, you know, I, I, during Brother Hiles' uh, I, heyday, I mean, there was a lot of people that attended services there, lots and lots and lots. That's a place that it's real easy to hide in. You know, to not, not to, to go in as a chameleon, if you will, you know, incognito, and you fit the part, you act the part, but as soon as you leave, you know, you can put on that worldliness again. You know, I worked with a gentleman at, at FedEx Freight, and I've given you this story before, but it fits so perfectly when it comes down to this point of declaring the way. You know, he was a supervisor, and I worked there for about two years, a little over two years, and, you know, I could tell there was something different about him. 
I couldn't put my thumb on it or finger on it. I just thought, like, man, what is different about you? You know, you know, around the guys that we talked to, he, he would, uh, you know, uh, he'd cuss and, you know, party like the rest and, you know, uh, he'd talk dirty and, you know, but then he would act a little bit differently around the college students that were there. So I went up to him one day. There was no one else around, and I, I, I named his name. and said, hey, man, I go, I got a question that's kind of off the cuff. I know we're working right now. I go, but it's bothered me. I go, have you ever attended First Baptist Church of Hammond? And he stopped for a minute, and he, he panicked look on his face. He looks around, makes sure there's no one else around there. And he literally, this is the, the exact words that came out of his mouth. Who told you? I mean, what do you mean who told me? I'm like, I don't, I don't, no one told me that. He goes, well, my, he goes, my dad's a Sunday school teacher at, at First Baptist Church of Hammond. He goes, uh, he goes, but don't, he goes, don't tell anybody. You know, I, I walked away, and I, well, I walked away, I drove away on my forklift, and I was thinking, man, my heart broke. And I thought, you know, God could be using you right where you're at to reach the individuals that you're working with, yet you're wanting to fit in. You want to be an incognito Christian. You know, we were not called to be incognito Christians. We were called to declare the way. You know, that's why the Bible tells us to go ye into all the world and preach to proclaim the gospel to every individual by word and by the way we live. You know, what, hey, could, if someone were to come to you that was an unsaved person, they looked at your life, would they want what you have? Or would they look at you and say, you know what, you're the same as me. Why would I want what you have when I already got what you, quote, unquote, say to have? You know, declare the way. Romans chapter 10, verse 11 through 15. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Hey, if you believe on him, you shouldn't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That word preacher there again is talking about a proclaimer. It's not talking about a pastor. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Hey, someone needs you to go to them and tell them. Just like in John the Baptist's day, someone needed to hear John the Baptist tell them to repent. You know, meaning turn from their way of thinking unto God's way of thinking. To say, you know what, hey, it's Jesus Christ alone that I need in order for salvation and nothing else. My good works can't get me there. Baptism can't get me there. You know, nothing I do can get me there other than Jesus Christ. It may be that God wants to use you to proclaim it to someone else. Hey, have you talked to your family members recently? For those of you that are in here that have unsaved family members, I'm not talking about you forcing it down their throat. You know, but be personable about it. You know, almost every time I, I, I spend time with family, I have an opportunity to at least plant some seeds of those that are unsaved. You know, to at least get the gospel. Somebody said, well, you're a pastor. You should be doing that. No, the Bible tells us all of us should be doing that. Every single one of us should be proclaiming Christ. You know, if, as someone come up to you and said, oh, you're a Christian? You know, what was your response to that? I'm a Christian. You know, and you shyly say a Christian. Or, no, I ain't one of those. You know, no, or is it, hey, yeah, I am. Hey, uh, well, you know, do you want to be? <laughs> hey, proclaim it to him. Don't be ashamed of it. You know, John the Baptist surely wasn't ashamed of it. John the Baptist lost his head because of it. You know, he was willing to, to, to go that way, to prepare the way for Christ, to declare Christ. Number three and last, not only do we need to clear the way, not only do we need to clear the way, just like John the Baptist, we need to get out of the way. We need to get out of the way. Verses 13 through 17 go over the fact of Jesus Christ coming. Jesus Christ needing to get baptized. And you see that one verse there where, where he, he argues a little bit with Jesus. And not in a way where he was trying to be rebellious. But he looked at it and said, hey, no, I must need to be baptized by you. And Jesus Christ, no, 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 no. He goes, no, I, I need you to do this. This is the proper thing. This is the proper thing for you to do. And, and he gave in, to, to, gave in to Christ. And then immediately afterwards, that ministry started, and, and John the Baptist pushed those individuals to Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, turn there in your Bibles. The last verse I'll have you look at this morning. We're doing awesome on time. You know, give me just a few more minutes, and we'll be done. Hey, we get in to get it. We don't get in to get out. We get in to get something. You know, I, at camp this week, you know, some of those children sat through services that are longer than 35 minutes. 
Some of them sat through a service that was an hour and a half long, not including any of the games or anything that was going on, usually a two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour uh, deal. And, and many of them, many of them responded in a great way after all that preaching. So I think we can sit through 35 minutes and be okay this morning. I'm watching the time. I know that many of you are probably getting hungry just like I am. You know, but at the very least, let's make sure we get something from God this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verses 6 and 7. So number three, get out of the way. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and 7 says, I have, a plant, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. You know, it's easy for us sometimes to get in our own head that we're the ones doing the saving. You know, I, you know, I led that person to Christ. You know, and God used you as a tool. It was God that ultimately saved them. He's the one that gave the increase. He's the one that did the work. You're the one that just followed by obedience. We need to get out of the way. You know, we need to make sure that we allow him the room. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Letter A, trust. That means trust him. Get out of the way and do what he's told you to do. You know, John the Baptist had to trust Jesus Christ when Jesus said, no, I need to be baptized. You need to baptize me because it's the necessary thing. He had to trust him, and he did. He trusted him. He said, okay, Lord, and... He goes on, he didn't say those exact words, but you see it through his actions. He goes and baptizes him. You know, one of the things that I love in the Bible, my, I look at it as my life's verse, and, you know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. You know, it's hard to trust sometimes. It's hard to look at it and say, well, Lord, I, 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 I just can't give it over to you because, you know, I need to be in control of this. No, God's looking at you and saying, no, I want every area of your life. I want you to trust me. Get out of the way so I can work. You know, I was telling my Sunday school class, I think it was this morning, if I remember correctly, you know, there are three reasons why uh, problems arise in our life. You know, one is we cause them. Two, you know, God, God may, you know, allow something in there as a teaching for us to come back to him. And, and maybe even the fact that just like Job, God gave a, a, a testing period in Job's life. He allowed the devil to, to have some instance in his life. You know, a good majority of the time when we're facing things in our life, it's our problem. Meaning, hey, we caused it. You know, it wasn't the devil. It wasn't God bringing a testing period. It's, it's we caused it because we weren't willing to trust him in the first place. We weren't willing to get out of the way and allow him to work in our lives. Hey, it's, I, I know it's easy for me as a preacher to get up here and preach this at that, that point, but it, deep down in my heart right now, I'm thinking, man, Lord, it's hard to accept it because when you face those things that are the hard things to accept, that's when God's saying, okay, are you going to let me work? Or are you going to get in my way? Are you going to stand out of the way? Are you, are you going to uh, allow me to do what I need to do that is necessary in your life? Letter B, get out of the way means not only that you have to trust, but you have to obey. You have to obey. It's so much more than just having confidence in God. It's obeying him. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that, that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnations. Or dam damnation. You know, so God, God puts these powers in our life, higher powers, to help us. But if you look at higher power in general, who is the ultimate higher power? God himself. And God's looking at us and he's saying, hey, I not only want you to trust me, he goes, I want you to obey. You know, it's like a, a, a parent going to a child and saying, well, do you trust me? Yeah, I trust you. Well, then I want you to do this. Well, I, don't, I can't do that. You know, trust and obedience go hand in hand. It's not just that you have confidence. It's the fact that you have so much confidence that you say, no, I'm willing to do it. Because what does Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6 say? In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That takes obedience. It's not just trust. It's obeying. Obeying God. You know, if you want to uh, be used by God in your life, you've got to get out of the way. If you're in here this morning and, and you're not saved, God's wanting you to get out of the way, to trust him and obey him. That what he says is the truth. None of us have seen God. You know, and if you have, please, you know, don't tell me. You know, I, 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 know I, back, I don't know, it was back in the 70s or something like that. Someone wrote a book on the fact that they had some experience and they saw was a 50-foot high Jesus with long hair and everything else. I'm like, yeah, that's not the God of the Bible I, I've seen. You know, that's not, that's not the Jesus that the Bible describes. You know, so please don't tell me if, you, if you've seen some vision or else like that. But none of us have physically seen God. You know, so it takes just as much faith for your pastor as it does for you to trust and obey, to get out of God's way, 
You know, it takes just as much trust for me to accept Jesus Christ as being my personal Savior as it will for you to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But it's simple. It's simple. He didn't make it hard. He died in your place so that you could have salvation. Are you willing to step out of the way and stop trusting in your own good works to get you to heaven and trust in Jesus' works to get you to heaven, that sacrifice that he made? Are you willing to stop putting your trust in religion? Hey, folks, I'd be the first person here to say that I hate religion. And you say, well, what are you, what are you talking about? The fact that, you know, a man has, has taken the focus off of God and put it all on pomp and circumstance. I put it on, uh, all on, uh, uh, on, on uh, what do you call it, uh, the religiosity of going through the motions, uh, 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 you know, the, the, that they do. You know, all these little uh, uh, vain repetitional prayers and, you know, all that goes into it. And that's, that's not what God wanted for us. Are you willing to get out of the way and say, you know, I'm setting religion aside. And I'm going to open up the Bible and see what God has to say about it. You know, but God gives us what he wants us to have. Get out of the way. In conclusion this morning, God used John to prepare the way for his son's ministry. John's heart was prepared for the Savior to come. Is your heart prepared to accept Jesus? Not only for salvation, but in every other area of your life. If you're saved in here, would you be willing, if God came to you and said, I want you to take this out of your life and stop doing this, to say, yes, Lord, I'll do it. And not just listen, but to obey and do it. You know, because salvation is just the first step. That's the first step. The next step is allowing God into every other area of your life. You may be here today and have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Would you ask him to save you today so that you can spend eternity with him someday? He made it simple. He did all the hard work. All he wants you to do is to trust him. All he wants you to do is be willing to take that trust, that little bit of faith, and act on it by asking him to save you. Would you be willing to do that this morning? You know, if you're, if you're someone that's in here that's not saved, we'll give you an opportunity here in a minute to walk an aisle, to sit down. I'll sit down with you personally and share with you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're going to have. It's not my word. You know, I can't save anybody, but God can, and I can show you how he can. Would you be willing to do that this morning? If you're willing to do that, I'll give you an opportunity here in a minute. Well, for those of us that are saved, you know, John not only had a prepared heart for Christ, he also prepared the way for Christ to be received by others. Are you preparing others to receive Christ by telling them about that gift that you have already received? That gets of eternal life? Who was it you recently spoke to about salvation? Who was it recently that you gave them a track that had that plan of salvation on it? If you've already asked Jesus to save you and give you a place in heaven when you die, would you be willing to ask him to help you to better prepare others to receive Christ? Would you ask him to help you to lead others to him? Let's do our part to allow Christ to change us and to change others, just like John did in his life. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord, that you give to us. Lord, I, I don't know what I would do without your word. Lord, I love the, the fact that you've given us your word. Lord, so that we don't have to be confused about this life that we live in. Lord, that you give us definitives. Lord, everything is black and white, clear as day. We know right from wrong by what you have to say. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to accept this truth, Lord, that we've, that we've learned this morning. Not a, not a new truth for many of us. Lord, but every once in a while, we need to get a little bit of shove to get out there, Lord, and do our part. Father, I pray that if there's someone in here this morning that does not know you as their personal Savior, Lord, that they'd be willing to take that little bit of faith, Lord, that they have and put it all in Jesus Christ, who is the way, who is the truth, and the life. Lord, I pray that if there's someone in here this morning that has already done that, Lord, that you'd help us to be convicted in our life, Lord, to do more for you. Lord, if we're all honest, in our, Lord, we, we've held back in some areas. Lord, and we all are guilty of that. Father, help us to prepare the way. Lord, just like John set the example for us. Lord, just like your son set the example for us. Lord, that we prepare the way for your son. Lord, and we'll give you that praise that you deserve for all of it. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.